Now we know that the nervous system has a number of different cell types associated with it. And these cell types can be broken up into two categories. First is neurons, second is glia. So we're gonna have a look at the different types of neurons and glia within the nervous system. But first we need to divide the nervous system into the central and peripheral. Remember the central nervous system is the brain, brain stem and spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system, all the nerves that come out and away and back in to the brain, brain stem and spinal cord. So what we're gonna do is have a look at neurons and glia separated by these two classifications, central nervous system and peripheral nervous system. Now the one cell type that is nearly indistinguishable from the two are the neurons. So neurons will be found everywhere within the, within the central nervous system. So even just the brain, for example, there's going to be 100 billion neurons. Within the uh, spinal cord, there's going to be about 100 to 200 million neurons. Even in the gut, there's actually about half a billion neurons as well. So neurons are all over the place. What does a general neuron look like? Because they all look very different. So I'm just gonna draw up probably a picture of a neuron that you've seen before and highlight some of the important structural components. All right, so first thing is neurons. We need to talk about very quickly, what is a neuron and what does it do? Well, very simply, neurons are the excitable cells. So what does that mean to be an excitable cell? Well, there's some cells within the body that can be excited through certain electrical impulses. These cells are generally neurons and muscular or muscle cells or myocytes. And what these cells do is when they're excited, they can perform some sort of activity or function. When it comes to neurons, they're excitable cells. And when they're excited, what they do is they send signals and communicate. Send signals communicate. The question is, what do they communicate with? Well, a couple of things. Neurons can either communicate with other neurons. Neurons can communicate with muscles. Or neurons can communicate with glands. Okay, so they're the excitable cells that can communicate to other neurons, muscles and glands. What do they look like? Well, you know that I'm probably one of the best drawers you've ever seen. So I'm gonna try my hardest to maintain my notoriety as being a wonderful drawer. <laughs> All right. Not the best, but that's okay. Okay, so this is probably a or similar to a picture that you may have seen in your textbook, for example. This is a neuron. A couple of things we need to identify in the neuron. First thing is this. These projections you see at the end here, these are called dendrites. And what dendrites do is they receive any incoming signals. So dendrites will receive a signal, maybe coming from another neuron or some sort of receptor, coming in and then you've got the major or largest portion of the cell here called the soma and the soma is the cell body. Remember soma means body. And you're also gonna have a nucleus within that soma. You're also gonna have all the other types of organelles that you've heard of before, such as the Golgi apparatus, endoplasmic reticulum, ribosomes, mitochondria, and so forth, they're all located within this soma. Then you're gonna have a part of the neuron, which is basically the neck between the soma and the axon, called the axon hillock. Axon hillock. Now, the axon hillock is important because this is the area that starts to propagate and produce the action potential, which is the signal that's gonna be sent down this axon, which means that this is the axon. The axon is the longest projection coming off of the neuron. And at the end of an axon, where the neuron terminates, they're called the terminal receptor, uh, they're called the uh, synaptic terminals. Synaptic terminals or synaptic bulbs, it's up to you. This is where the signal finishes and then it either needs to communicate with another neuron or communicate with a muscle or communicate with a gland. 
Remember, neurons don't actually touch other neurons. Neurons don't touch muscles or glands. There is a little gap here called the synapse, which is where chemical signals need to diffuse across in order to tell the next, either neuron, muscle or gland, what to do. They can be excitatory or inhibitory. So this is the general outline of a neuron. Now remember, most neurons will be myelinated, which means they have an insulation or a rubber coating protecting certain parts of the axon. Now I said rubber coating, it's obviously not rubber, but it's synonymous with the rubber coating that you have lining the outside of your wires at home. Why do we have this rubber coating? Well, it protects the signal that's being sent through and allows that signal to continue. So if that rubber coating was stripped, what may happen is that you may lose uh, the signal on the other end or the quality may be diminished. That's the same thing that happens here. We need this myelin, which is basically just fatty layers, okay? That's just fat that's wrapped around. This myelin to insulate the signal that's being sent down the axon, help it propagate down without being lost. Okay, now that's a neuron. Let's now talk about the other cell types within the nervous system, which are called glia. So firstly, I wanna look at glia within the central nervous system. Glia in central nervous system. First thing is, what does glia mean? Glia is Greek for glue. And what they are, if we have a look at the function, is basically they're the supporting cells of the nervous system. So they're supporting cells. And what that means is they help maintain the internal environment and that environment around the neuron. So there's many different types of glia, all having many different roles, but overall their role is to support the neurons in one way or another. So let's have a look at the different types. First type I wanna talk about are the types of glia that help wrap the axons of the neuron within the central nervous system. This type of glia are called oligodendrocytes. Oligodendrocytes. What are their function? They myelinate neurons within the central nervous system. So that's brain, brainstem, and spinal cord. So they myelinate CNS neurons. How do they do it? Well, this is important because if I were to just draw a very dodgy picture of neurons, and another neuron here, Okay, what the oligodendrocytes do is, this will be an oligodendrocyte, they have these projections, these arms that come off and they start to wrap around the axons of the neurons like that. So this is what the oligodendrocytes do in the central nervous system to protect the axons of neurons. What's another type of glia within the central nervous system? Well, another type of glia are astrocytes. Astro sounds like space, right? Astro. Well, this is important because astro, referring to star, these astrocytes look like stars. So they basically look like this. And again, very rough drawing. But you can see that the soma have all these arms projecting off it like that. So it looks like a star. What do astrocytes do? Well, they play a couple of different roles, one of which is to maintain the environment surrounding the neurons. But another important role is that it is involved in the blood-brain barrier which means it helps regulate what does and does not go from the bloodstream and the systemic circulation into the bloodstream that's supplying the brain. Very important. What's another type of glia? Ependymal cells. Remember, these are all glia of the central nervous system. Ependymal cells. Well, in your brain, I've done a video on this, so you should know about it. In the brain, there are hollowed out cavities. These cavities are called ventricles and these ventricles produce cerebral spinal fluid which floats around the brain floats around the brain stem floats around the spinal cord helps to wash away any metabolic byproducts potentially del deliver nutrients and also provide a cushioning if the brain and spinal cord starts to move around the ventricles produce this csf in these ventricles so i'm going to try and draw so there's a brain you'll find that there's four ventricles within the brain you're going to have two lateral ventricles one in each hemisphere, you're gonna have a fourth ventricle, a third ventricle, sorry, and a fourth ventricle. Okay, 
these ventricles here on the roofs and lining other aspects of the ventricles, but predominantly the roofs, you're going to have these cell types called ependymal cells. And what these ependymal cells do is that they produce the CSF. So ependymal cells produce the cerebral spinal fluid within the ventricles. What's the last cell type I want to talk about when it comes to glia in the central nervous system? Well, it's going to be a cell type called microglia. Micro means small. They're small glia. They are small glia. And they look like immune cells. So they've got these projections that come off and what they do is they phagocytose. They engulf anything that should not be there. So they play an immune role in phagocytose. So immune role. All right. So the glia within the central nervous system, oligodendrocytes, myelinate, uh, the neurons, astrocytes, pro uh, protect the neurons by forming part of the blood-brain barrier, epidermal cells produce the cerebral spinal fluid in the ventricles, and microglia play an immune role because they phagocytose any invading particles or substances that shouldn't be there. What about the glia within the peripheral nervous system? Well, there's only two I want to talk about. First type are the Schwann cells. Okay, what are Schwann cells? Well, I told you that oligodendrocytes create the myelin in the central nervous system. Schwann cells create the myelin in the peripheral nervous system. So they're the myelinating cells within the peripheral nervous system. But they do it in a different way to oligodendrocytes. That's why I showed you that image there with the oligodendrocytes projecting out and wrapping around. Schwann cells do it differently. If I were to draw up Again, two neurons, very dodgy. Schwann cells each, so here you can see one oligodendrocyte creates multiple myelinated regions. One Schwann cell creates one myelinated region, and then another Schwann cell, and then another Schwann cell, and then another Schwann cell, okay? The last type of cell I wanna talk about of glia within the peripheral nervous system are satellite cells. Okay, what do satellite cells do? Well, they myelinate as well. They myelinate the cell bodies of neurons within the peripheral nervous system. Now, generally speaking, not all neurons look like this, where you've got the cell body on one end and the axon on the other end. Sometimes you'll find neurons look like this, where the cell body sits halfway through, okay? This is often what you're gonna find with sensory neurons, for example. And what satellite cells do is they tend to myelinate and protect the cell body in the peripheral nervous system. Okay, so they regulate that environment, help protect and maintain the soma or the body of the neuron in the peripheral nervous system. Another interesting point that you should know is this. Cell bodies of neurons in the central nervous system are called cell bodies. Cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system are termed ganglia. Ganglia is cell body in the peripheral nervous system. Okay, that's a quick summary of neurons and glia within the nervous system.